my interest was to combine fluorescence and magnetism in one small package, as small as possible, because uh, having a really tiny size is critical for biology. The in vivo environment is very crowded. You have to be able to diffuse, you have to be able to get out of blood vessels or the vessel walls to target things, and the smaller the better. There have been magnetic fluorescent particles before, but usually they've been at the expense of a lot of extra volume. So you end up with these big particles with a lot of extra stuff like silica, a lot of organics, and then embedded into that, you, it's more like a muffin with a, a small number of raisins in them rather than the raisins all clumped up together. I, I recently had a postdoc who had a magic thumb, and he was able to create these dual function particles, nanoparticles, where very small magnetic particles form the core of the super particle. And then surrounding this core of magnetic particles is a shell of fluorescent particles. And so now we can use the magnetism of the inside for two different kinds of things. That we've used them for two different things. One of them is for um, enhancing the contrast in MRI for imaging. The second one is to use them as um, for magnetic force. So you put, if you put a magnetic field or a gradient, a magnetic field gradient, then you can manipulate these big particles using an external magnetic field. You can watch them one at a time using the fluorescence. And then what we've done in addition is to cover these super particles with silica, with glass. And glass is this ubiquitous thing that we know how to do lots of things with. We can put all kinds of molecules on them. It's very inert biologically. And so now we have this bright 100 nanometer or 50 nanometer particle that is biocompatible. We can use an external field to move it around, to push, to pull, and we can follow it in real time. And we've got a bunch of collaborators that are trying to understand the mechanics of cells or the transport of, of payloads down neurons, for instance, and the little motors that carry that payload and how much force is required to carry the payload and putting magnetic fields to sort of, as a break, to prevent that payload from arriving and seeing how the neuron reacts to those things. And so it's, it, it's, it, they're very interested in using thing, these things as a tool to understand the biology. I have a very long-standing collaboration with uh, Rakesh Jain's group at the Steel Laboratory across the river at MGH. Uh, and with him, we've done a lot of um, uh, imaging experiments using quantum dots to image largely the tumor microenvironment. We've learned a lot of things about how in the nanometer size, uh, size range, size is really critical in terms of delivering payloads. Um, you've got normal blood vessels that have very tight walls that don't allow big things to go through. Then you've got the uh, morphologically abnormal blood vessels and tumors. You can go through that vasculature, that, that vessel wall, and then you have to diffuse through tissue to deliver your payload, to deliver your, your drug, or what, what have you. So we've, we've done a lot of work studying how size is important in delivering like chem chemotherapeutics to tumors. Um, and for instance, recently we, we ended up understanding uh, why certain drugs that uh, take a tumor vasculature and make it look like normal vasculature, that renormalize it, the term is renormalize the vasculature, if you take those drugs and you combine them with certain therapeutics that are being used today, like Braxane or Doxel, that, for instance, the combination works well for Braxane, but it doesn't work for Doxel, at least in the animal studies that we've done. And we've understood that because of the size of the chemotherapeutic, that the Braxane is a lot smaller than Doxel, and so it can diffuse, when you renormalize the vessel, it can diffuse more readily into the tumor and therefore be more efficacious, where the doxel is too big and it doesn't make it through. And so this gives us an idea of how to design then nanomedicine or what the challenges are for designing nanomedicine to be more effective. Attaching payloads to the quantum dots is not really somewhere we're going, but rather using the quantum dots to be able to design something that looks like the quantum dot but can be biocompatible, made out of polymers or what have you, that they can behave like the quantum dot that we saw behave.